Hello. This is my Land Rover. And that is a flat tire. It's not terrible actually, it's a slow puncher and if I was to pump that up I'd probably get a couple of days out of it before it went back to being in that state. But as I'll tell you about in a minute, you can't rely on a slow puncher to carry on being a slow puncher so it does need sorting. What I'm going to do then is go through the procedure of changing this wheel and obviously show you how it's done on the Land Rover which will be of academic interest to most of you I suspect but there will be a few tips which will be pertinent to more usual vehicles let's say. First thing to do then once you've pulled off the road in somewhere that's relatively safe as flat as you can um, is to chock the end of the vehicle that's not going to be jacked. I've got a couple of chocks here this one is from the Soviet Union and came with the Zill. This one is a rubber block. Um, that a man in the MOT garage gave me actually. Crikey, about 20 years ago. Either of these will do. On the Land Rover, on this Land Rover, if I had it in four wheel drive and I put the transmission brake on, that would lock the transmission and I could lift one axle and the other axle would stay put. Although, there's quite a lot of play in the transmission, it wouldn't stay all that put. Yeah, so it's, it's best to chock it, even, even so. On a normal car with a normal handbrake, if you were lifting the front, I'd say the, the rear could be held with the handbrake. But always best to chock it to be on the safe side. Right then, next. We need to loosen off the wheel nuts. Now this is the classic one, and I've done it myself plenty of times, where you lift up the car and then realise that you need to undo the wheel nuts. Not undo them, but loosen them. So let's do that now. As I'll go over in a minute, it's very important to have the right wheel brace on board that fits snugly. This one does. Now these aren't going to be up very tight because I've had this wheel off quite recently. But if they were tight, I've got some extra leverage here. And I can put that on and then I can push down or I can even jump on the end if I have to. In practice, I've generally found that if they are really tight, putting some fat boy weight on it does the job. If they've been done up by your local tyre place and the guy's used his big air gun and gone all out on it, then yeah, you're going to need one of those. <laughs> But the thing is, no matter how tight it is, no matter how feeble you are, with a bit of leverage, you can undo a wheel nut. On my old Bedford MK lorry, I used to carry a six foot scaff tube to undo the wheel nuts, because they were proper tight. So it's doable, whatever. They're loose enough now. Next then we need to lift this wheel up. Here then we've got two jacks which are similar but different. This is a hydraulic jack. Um, this one came from a Discovery. This one is a mechanical screw jack that came from the distant past. They have very much have pros and cons these two and so I'll go over that briefly now. I used to always carry this one and it's dead handy so with a hydraulic jack you turn this screw here and that seals it so that when you pump this pump it's pumping up pressure inside the cylinder and then forcing up 
this bit. And as you keep going, it will then do a little extra bit at the top. Now there it comes out. And that's the problem with hydraulic jacks. In fairness, probably only the hydraulic jacks that people like me use when they're well past their sell-by date. Yeah, the vehicle that this came from is long gone. Uh, yeah. So the seals will wear out and then it starts leaking oil and then after a while it'll only go up to a certain height. And I've also come across hydraulic jacks failing under load. So when they say don't work under a vehicle that's only supported by a jack, that's why I found in practice that it's much more likely that you're going to have a catastrophic failure with a hydraulic jack. It's very rare, don't get me wrong, it's not, I'm not trying to scaremonger here, but if it goes, it's going to go properly. This is a mechanical screw jack, so you can see it's a completely different operation. As you turn this clockwise, this little cup here rises up. And if there's clearance before you need it, you can just spin this round and get a bit of extra lift out of it. The downside of a mechanical jack is that it takes ages, <laughs> it takes absolutely ages to wind it up and it's considerably more effort to do so. In order to jack up the vehicle then, what we need is somewhere to jack... I'm just, just about to take jack off, that's not enough work is it? In order to jack up the vehicle then, we need to find a secure jacking point. And that's quite easy on this Land Rover because I can jack on the axle if I want to get the wheel off the ground or I can jack on the chassis if I want to lift the whole vehicle up. If I were to put it somewhere under the chassis and start lifting, um, then the springs would just drop and the wheel would pretty much stay on the ground until I got the chassis way up in the air. So on the Land Rover, I'm going to go for the axle. On a normal car, you have to be a bit more careful because the only place you can get the jack will be somewhere like there, but if you just put your jack under a, a convenient bit of bodywork and start cranking away, you'll just put a massive dent in that bit of bodywork. So on a normal car, which is a monocoque construction, just folded sheet metal, there'll be reinforced jacking points and you need to find one of those and either the jack will sit under that point, it'll be very obvious where it is, or some jacks slide into, there'll be a receiving bracket for it to go in there and then you can wind away. So it's usually round about there and so just in front of this wheel or just behind this wheel, somewhere like that. But it will be quite apparent yeah, on, on a modern vehicle it's pretty obvious where you should jack it and where you shouldn't. But like I say, on this, we're going for the axle. Right, good. And I'm giving the vehicle a shove to see if it's going to stay on the jack. Because if that chock's not quite in the right place, when I do that it'll just fall off. But better know now. <laughs> yeah, that's more or less going to stay there for a bit. Right. Just get off the ground. Now, just bear in mind that it's wobbly. <laughs> Particularly if you're doing this in the dark and the rain. 
Yeah, just be cautious. All right, so get rid of this one. And I'm gonna replace it with this one for now. So obviously being a Land Rover owner, I have an abundance of wheels and tires. This one's quite reasonable. It's not going to stay on here long term because this one is actually part of a set which is going to go on Project Kermit and not on these wheels either. I'm just nipping them up, I'm not tightening them at all. Not really because the wheel will just spin round. Now we can nip them up. So if you're not super strong, you probably want to stand on it. Okay. On the Land Rover, we've got five studs. So the best thing to do is to do them up in a star pattern. So I do one there, and I go over to there. I go over to there. Over there. And finally down there. What that does is just make sure that the wheel is being clamped on square to the hub that's behind it. Yeah, that's really important. I think it was a Ford Transit I had when I was very, very young and I just did up the nuts round in a circle and I ended up with the wheel slightly wonky on there and of course it came loose um, pretty soon afterwards. Not what you want. So what's prompted this video was a recent incident I had when out driving in this thing. Um, I was visiting some friends of mine and when I came to leave the driver's side front tyre was properly flat. Now they said, oh, you know, you need to change that and everything, maybe stay here a bit longer, all this sort of stuff. Um, but I wanted to get back before it was dark, so I used my tire inflator, which I had on board, and I pumped up the tire, and it seemed to hold air, so I thought, fine, a slow puncture there, nothing to worry about, and I drove off. Um, about an hour into my journey, the steering went all wrong, and it was very obvious that the tire had gone flat again, so I pulled over. I thought, well, if I pump it up again, I get another hour, I'll be home by then. So I pumped it up again, set off, and about five minutes later, poof, off it went, big time this time. So <laughs> that was the end of that. Um, I happened to be on a main road in the middle of a village with nowhere at all to pull over. So I had to drive on until I could find um, somewhere safe just to pull over and actually even just to have a look and see what was going on. So I pulled over and this is what I was confronted with. The bead had broken on the tyre because I'd driven it when it was completely flat and the inner tube because this is a old style of wheel and these tyres here need inner tubes. The inner tube had disappeared. The valve was supposed to poke out this hole and well <laughs> it's just got inside somewhere. So there's no visible damage on the outside of the wheel and that means that the the inner tube's given up in some way. I suspect it was a substandard inner tube from the off. That's probably what's caused this, but yeah, we'll find out. 
So having pulled over somewhere safe then, I thought not a problem, I'll just change the tyre. Got a spare tyre on the bonnet here. <laughs> Admittedly in quite terrible condition. I pulled out my jack and that's when the troubles began. So this is a complete schoolboy error. The jack which I tested underneath the car with the tyres inflated, I could barely fit underneath it when I'd lost all that height with the tyre being completely down. I'll show you what I mean. Down here then, under the front axle, this jack sits quite nicely there. But when the tyre was completely deflated, I couldn't even fit it, even with this wound all the way down, I couldn't fit it under there, all I could do is fit it under this bit of the spring, which is a pretty dire place to try and jack it from. Had it been on this side, I could have put it under the axle, it would have been fine, but there's just no room under here to fit the jack. It was just an inch or so too tall. Still I got around that issue and with a bit of faffing about I managed to get the jack somewhat underneath the road spring there. Um, so before I lifted up the wheel I started to undo the wheel nuts. And that's when I encountered the second issue. And this is purely neglect on my part, this is entirely my fault. So I took the wheel brace which I'd stowed, so I made sure I had the, what I thought was the right tools. I undid a couple of the nuts on the wheel there and then I came to undo the next one and it turned out the wheel brace didn't quite fit, it wasn't quite the right size for the nut and one of the nuts was pretty dodgy. You see there how gnarly it is. <laughs> and like a fool, I must have noticed that at some point and just let it slip. So, yeah. So the more I tried to get it off, the worse it was looking. And you see there the mashed up bits. That's when, in, in desperation, all I could do was get some grips on it and try there. But the trouble with grips, no matter how hard you actually grip the grips, they've only got two points of contact. Well, it's obviously a proper socket. I have six. So yeah, because of that, <laughs> struggle as I might, there was no way I could undo that nut on my own and I had to call a man out. <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, it's been an awful long time since I've called a recovery guy. And uh, yeah, he came out with an actual socket, had it off in seconds. There we go. So this is the offending corner of the vehicle and you can see here it's now got brand new wheel nuts all round. <laughs> and so is the other front wheel and so is that back wheel. Ah. So yeah. Last thing to do is take the chock out of the way. Actually, you can see on this one, that was when I didn't take the chock out of the way and drove the Zill over its own chock. Oh well. <laughs> so that's the tyre I've just taken off. And this is the one that failed when I was actually driving. Both of these are actually quite good tyres. There's plenty of tread left on them. There's no real significant cracking, so I want to use these. They also match the other two tyres that are on there. So in other words, I've got a full set, of, well not a full set, I've got four of these tyres. So that's why I'm going to sort these two out if I can and I think I can because I suspect in both cases it's the inner tubes that have let me down. It's possible there's a puncture in there somewhere but equally it's possible that it's just the substandard rubber on the inner tubes. Now the thing is that hardly any tyres use inner tubes anymore so I'm thinking that the ones that you tend to get aren't all that, aren't all that great. 
Anyway, we'll find out because we're going to open them up, as it were. The first stage then in changing a the tyre, as opposed to just changing a wheel, is to break the bead. This is the bead, this bit here, and you can see on this one I broke the bead by driving it, which is very much not advised. On most cars, well on pretty much anything really, if you drive with it flat, not only will you ruin the tyre, but you'll also ruin the wheel very quickly, particularly if it's an alloy. Um, yeah, this bit here really shouldn't be banging along the road. On this one, I've probably got away with it. The other slight advantage I have is I don't need, on a tubeless tyre, you've got to imagine that the tyre itself has to seal against this. So this part of it, the actual wheel here, has to be perfect all the way around, otherwise it's not going to seal and you'll never keep any air in the tyre. Because I'm going to be running with inner tubes, it's not quite so critical. And it's still fairly important, but it's not absolutely crucial. Anyway, this bead is broken for us, so that's fine. On the back though, the bead is still on there. And then you just and of course on this wheel the bead is still intact. Now, the reason why we're around the front of the Land Rover is because this is the first technique that I had any real success with for getting the bead off of a, a wheel. So we'll go through that, see if I can remember how to do it. What we're going to do then is to pop the tyre off of this bit. Now, we've got a bit of an advantage here that it's a nice sunny day and this tyre will have warmed up a bit so it makes the rubber a bit more flexible. Yeah, I mean that is, that is a big bonus actually. Right, what I'm going to do is get the rest of the air out of here by taking out the valve. So I've got one of these little things. there is a little valve core and this is just a little tool that you get this one actually came with a bottle of uh, tire sealant you know, puncture sealant stuff now you can tease that little valve core out using um, an electrical screwdriver but it is a bit of a faff <laughs> not using the right tool um, all right, I'll put that somewhere safe and then forget about it I suppose plan is then just to push this tyre off of this metal bit here, so that's breaking the bead. Now, when I was initially attempting to do this, in the days before YouTube, <laughs> and when information was kind of sparse on how to go about these things, um, this is actually a process I always used to take to a local garage and pay them a five or a time to do it. And then one day the guy said, I'm really sorry, I'm not allowed to do it anymore. My boss won't let me work on second-hand tyres, which all mine were, being poor. So that's when I decided to work it out for myself. And here we are. Initially then, I went to the farm supply place and I bought this. And the idea of this thing is you put it over like that and then you hit it as hard as you can there with a lump hammer, like this one, and it pushes the bead down a bit and then you move around a bit and hit it again and so forth. But here's the thing, rubber is really boingy. <laughs> so when I do that, hopefully nothing happens. Now it's possible this would work on a tractor tyre because I have changed the tyres on my tractor before and the rubber was literally rock hard on the sidewall. And so when I hit it, I think with a sledgehammer I had to use, it actually did move and it stayed moved, if you see what I mean. And I could work my way all the way around and eventually pop it off. But I've had no success doing it on Land Rover wheels. 
I did have success jacking against the front bumper of the Land Rover because we need a weight to push off. Um, not with this jack, but with a scissor jack. So the type of cheap jacks that you get in cars that start off flat like that and open up like into a diamond shape. And pushing against the bumper here, that did actually work. Now I don't think it's going to work with this because this won't go high enough. What we might do is push against, i just shorten the distance somewhat, pushing against that. See there, that bead is disappearing. But yeah, we've run out of movement on the jack. But that, on this particular tyre, that would actually work. So, <laughs> if I didn't have the leaky seals, and this would go up on its extension a bit more, that would work. Or if I put in a bigger block of wood. One way of doing it. I then found out that um, I could use my high lift jack. Now a high lift jack is a very useful bit of kit. It's not so useful for jacking because it's very unstable but it's very useful for lots of other things. I'll go and grab that and show you. This is a high lift jack, this one's a five foot version. As you can see this is a purely mechanical jack but it's not a screw jack, um, unlike that other one that I used. This one has a ratchet mechanism and because it's all open and exposed it tends to get a bit clogged up, it's one of the downsides. Get some WD-40. Right, so what we've got here is a ratchet mechanism and it's currently in the down position. If I put it there, we'll now click. So it's a very useful bit of kit and I've actually used it as an engine hoist by hanging this from something strong, like an overhead beam, and then slinging the engine off the bottom there and lifting it like this, you can actually pull three and a half tons worth up obviously provided the overhead beam can cope with that. So obviously it'll also jack three and a half tons. You can also use it as a winch like that. So you anchor this end to something and then anchor that into something. And what I normally do is put a ratchet strap on one end so I can take up all the slack in the system and then you can winch the two bits together and you get about five foot of pull. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but because it's such a strong pull, that five foot of movement can be really crucial if you're like moving a tree or dragging a Land Rover out of a hole or something. One of the other things I use this for a lot is when I get vehicles stuck, I can lift up one end and plop it down to the side. And by doing that, you can actually rotate a vehicle round on the spot if you really want to. Anyway, so today we're gonna to try and use it for tires. So what I'll do is put the tire underneath like that. Now I'm not going to go straight in the middle of the bumper because obviously the stronger bit is going to be where it attaches to the chassis. Jack. I'm lifting the Land Rover but I'm also forcing this tire down. Let's see which gives up first. Now the disadvantage of this system is that the foot is quite a long way from where the actual bead sinks in there. So that's about as far as we're going to get with that, but it's very nearly 
released. What I'll do then is put that down. Now on a high lift jack, this is where you've got to be a bit careful. Because when I come back, when it goes click, it's going to put all the weight on that bar. So if my if I'm not holding tight, this will just fly up. So it looks like we're back where we started, but we're not. We've actually done quite a lot there. So now I'm going to move it around a little bit. And then repeat. couple of inches round from where I was last time. There we go. That's that. Now carefully get it. Still not a spring in that tail. Really. Now the bead's broken, the rest of it will just come off. And then we'll do the same on the other side. So this bead is still on. This won't put up so much of a fight, I generally find. down the, the inside it was a lot easier So I used that technique quite successfully for a while, um, but you might see now with the foot that it's it's slightly awkward because you're only being able to get part of the foot of the jack here in contact with the bit of tie that you want. Then I saw a picture somewhere of something that looked like this. So I made one of these up. This is just a bit of off-cut steel that I hammered into a curve and I welded it onto a plate and I put two um, studs in it. And what this did was located, where would it go, somewhere there I think. Yeah, so I bolted it onto the front of the jack there. And then this curve shape sat in there. And so you're pushing down an area that, that much rather than just one point. It's so much more effective. But as you can see this is covered in cobwebs and dust. I haven't used this in years. And I haven't used the jacking method in years either. That's why I was <laughs> struggling to remember how to do it. So we've got this bead broken on both sides of this one. And this other tyre here, still got to break the bead on there. After a while of using the jacking method then, I built a sort of very simple machine to help break the beads. So I'll go and drag that out of the storage and uh, we'll use that to do the second one here.
Right, here we are outside the workshop, and this is the well, the machine's a bit too grand a term. The tool. This is the tool I made to make breaking the bead an easier process. It's dead simple, it's just a frame. And this box actually goes in there, the handle. And then this bit here does the same job as that curved bit of metal that I showed you on the high lift jack. Well, let's see it in action. So I can't remember where I found the design for this, somewhere on the internet. But as you can see it's dead simple and just relies on leverage again. Now I made this primarily to do Land Rover tyres and it does. Um, the longer they've been on, you know, the harder they are to get off, but that'd be the case of anything. For car tyres and motorbike tyres, it's brilliant. Easy peasy. This shouldn't be too difficult in here. Oh, sliding a bit in here. There we go. <laughs> like I said, the inside one's normally pretty straightforward. So that would have taken a bit more effort to doing the other side, like we did with the high lift jack. But not that much more. So yeah, very handy bit of kit. So these are all things I use for tyres. This is a proper tyre changing lever and is quite useful. This one, yeah, it tends to bend. <laughs> not as useful. I suspect this may have been intended for motorbikes. Those, yeah, you can carry on anyway. This is a normal crowbar that comes in handy on occasion, but it tends to have uh, the edges here a bit sharp, really, for tire removal. And surprisingly, one of the most useful things is a great big flathead screwdriver, like this one. So, I think the secret to easy tire changing, as with many things in life, is plenty of lube. And that's what this is in here, some type of wax. Because what we've got to do is to drag this tire up and over this rim. And you can see there that's well rusty and this is a very hefty tire. So to make that magic happen, grease everything up well and good. So initially I didn't see the point of buying a massive tub of this stuff, or any of this stuff actually, and um, I thought I could get by just using liquid soap or washing up liquid. And you kind of can, but yeah, the proper stuff is a world of difference. And the thing is I bought this tub probably, <laughs> well, well over 10 years ago, and you can see you know, there's plenty to go yet, so it's a worthwhile investment. Right, so I'm just putting in the just that little lip there. There's a little rounded over bit. So I'm going to hook that in. Now, what you've got to be careful of with tube tyres like this. Generally, obviously this tube is knackered, but generally you've got to be careful not to pinch the tube at any point, that makes it all a bit more tricky. So, I'm going to move it around a bit. And the reason I moved it around is because you have to hook it in there, and on this side I'm going to stand on it, I'm going to push that bead into the well, which is this middle bit of the wheel. So by doing that, give myself enough space to flip that over there. 
Now, get another lever in. So again, making sure that the bit opposite is in the well. Let's pull that over. Now, it's really run out of levers. And by this point, so just tease it round. There we go. So we've got a lever out without the thing popping back in. So put the valve in the way there. So we'll go to this side. Again, I'm making sure the point opposite is down in the well. And, yep, I'll flip it up. and then it's coming around a little bit more. See how it's starting to get quite a lot easier. Now there's two reasons it seemed easy. One is that the tyre is warm because it's been in the sun and the second is putting all this wax on it. So now at that point, what I was going to say is at this point you can pull out the inner tube but because this valve stem is so well stuck in there Okay, as I was saying, at this point we can reach in and pull out the inner tube. Now I can't remember the history of this one, but I can see it's got some patches on already, so it's probably had its time. Yeah. <laughs> We've got one, two, what's that fleeing? Yeah. Another, there's another one there for. Yeah, I think it's probably been patched as much as it's going to tolerate being patched. Yeah. That's horrible. Right. So that's the tube out. I'll investigate that in a second. If I was actually changing the tyre for a different tyre, obviously I'd have to take it all the way off. So I'll just show you how I go about that. Right, let's look that bit through. Right, so that bar is through and it's hooked into the middle there, so it can't fall off. That's just a case of grabbing it. Good thing about going this far with it is I can now check and see if there's anything obvious like a nail sticking through. I always think it's unlikely to find a nail, but the last time I had a puncture on my motorbike, that's exactly what it was an actual pallet nail pointing right into the tyre. It looks so strange to be there, but. Initially I thought someone must have sabotaged the tyre, but thinking about the journey that I made, that was impossible. So somewhere on the road was a nail just sticking up, which I happened to find. Anyway. So there's nothing I can feel in here. I'm going to have a quick look at the outside.
No, nothing obvious there either. Right, what I'm going to do now is pump up that inner tube and put it under water and see where the hole is or see if it's just... I've had it before where they just loaded the inner tube is, is kind of like perished and there's just holes everywhere, just tiny tiny ones. So yeah, we'll, we'll see what's... I don't need to run the compressor because this tank is already full of air. See, that's at 100 psi. Right, we'll No way of showing that to you, but here, where this repair is, all this area around here is leaking very slightly. So you can see how that whole patch is drying out. That's probably because when I did this, however many years ago that was, <laughs> and it could be very many years ago, I probably over abraded that in order to get this patch to stick. You have to roughen up the rubber a bit. I've probably overdone it. But yeah, I don't know if that's coming out on camera, but I can see here this whole area is drying out, whereas all around it is still wet. Yeah, it's just making tiny bubbles out of that, but I can't quite... That's why it's a slow poke, I guess. So no big dramatic leaks on this, but there is a slow leakage from that repair there. And considering we've got one, two, three other repairs on there. I'm just going to replace this. Okay so having checked the inside of the tyre here for anything poking out that could cause trouble, can't find anything at all. So I'm going to put a new inner tube in. Well, it's branded airtight, <laughs> which is hopefully a good sign. At least it has a brand. seen people just throw it on just like like that and it just sort of plumps on I've never managed to do that and thankfully I don't have to do this very often it's probably just lack of practice So again, I'm kneeling on one bit 
to keep that in the well, which is the bit in the middle of the wheel. And then So good. Now then, need more wax. So I'm putting wax on the inner here because that's got to lip over, but I'm also waxing this bit here because we'll need that wax for actually seating the bead once it's on. Right, so I've got the valve is there opposite me, which means that I can kneel on this bit without squidging it. I'm going to start there. Now you've got to be careful not to pinch if you <laughs> If you've got something as a narca, there's a, a tube in there, you've got to be careful not to pinch the tube with this, which is very easy to do. Well, it is, I used to, as a kid, I used to do all the time on the bicycle. I'm a little bit better now. Right, so as I'm working around, I'm then pushing this bit right down. See there, that section there is pushed right into the well. And it's just a case of easing it over the rest. And it's gently done it because the tire is fairly warm because it's been in the sun, and because I've put all that wax on there. See, I'm not actually that force. And that's the knack of it, really. When I started doing this sort of thing. I thought it was took enormous amount of force to make it happen and of course it, like many things it's technique really. There we go. Right that's on. And then yeah, just flip it over and put more wax on the inside here. So the next thing to do is to take the valve out, well not the valve, take the valve core out, the new valve core that's in there. Uh, 
And then what I'm going to do is pump up the tyre and because the tyre, the inner tube of the tyre won't have this valve core in there, the air will rush in really quick. So my hope is I can inflate it fast enough that the bead will pop into the right place on the rim here. And there might be enough air in the tank to do this, there might not, I might have to put a compressor on, but we'll see. What's happening at first is that inner tube, as you can see, was completely deflated. It'll have to take its proper shape and untwist. And then we should see the tyre move. There we go. Have we got enough air to push it out? No poppers, we're lucky. Alright, actually, so that seems to be seating quite well. Right, I've got to take it off now. If you can see these lines here, they're all pretty much similar around, which means that it's seated on evenly. So if you could see some of these lines and not others, it would mean it was uneven, it wasn't seated properly. And it's the same on this side. If you look at those, those lines that are visible all the way around, they're reasonably even. So that is that. That seated then easier than I expected it to, which is great. Um, and that's partly because it's a good quality tyre, so it's still got some flexibility to it. It's partly because it's been warming in the sun, and that makes a huge difference. Even on a, it's not a very warm day today, but the fact it's been sat in the sun really softens up the rubber. But mainly, it's because I put on absolutely lashings of the wax. And it's, yeah. When you seat a um, tubeless tyre, it's quite a bit more tricky because obviously there's no tube in there to start inflating, so you have to try and make it seal a little bit to begin with. What they do in tyre changing places, they have what they call a, I think it's called a cheater, which is something that will, it's, it's a tank that's filled to huge pressure and it just rams in a load of air all at once to pop it on. Whereas obviously with a tube, in there you can inflate it slowly so even if I only had a foot pump I'd be able to seat this tube is what I'm trying to say <laughs> in a roundabout way. Right well that's jolly good um, let's put this back in so because that's seated now I can put the core in there, in there and put it up slowly so on a tube tyre like this, I could have just left that core in there and pumped it up. Um, but I much prefer to seat the bead first, make sure, every, make sure the tyre is evenly on the wheel first and then put the full dose of air in it. So that hissing noise you can hear is actually coming from the tank, not from the, <laughs> not from the new tyre. Or renewed tyre I should say. 20. So as a rule of thumb, um, 30 is a good pressure to head for if you don't know any different. When I'm running that Land Rover it's normally about 26 or so in the front and about 30 at the back. I found that works for me. In my Discovery for instance it was, I did about 33 all round. Um, the tractor I put 40 in the front and about 10 in the rear.
Sure. So now in case you're wondering why I don't just use these tyres um, without inner tubes, if it's more faff and if the inner tubes give up and if they're poor quality and so on and so forth, um, these particular tyres are supposed to have tubes. It says right here, tube type. There. As for the wheels, now I think this wheel is one of a set of uh, Defender wheels that I've got. Now this would take tubeless tyres. The earlier Land Rover series wheels um, won't, or they shouldn't. And the difference is that the Defender wheels are welded, so the sections are welded together. So it's the actual structure of the wheel itself is an airtight structure once you've got a tube, um, a tire on it. The early series Land Rover ones are riveted together and obviously the rivet is not necessarily airtight. Well, that's a bit esoteric really. <laughs> Well that's it then, you've seen me change the wheel and then take a tyre off, change an inner tube, put the tyre back on again. And I've demonstrated a few different ways of doing it as well. Hopefully that's been of interest and there was something in there that's, uh, that was new to you. And hopefully above all you can learn from my mistake and don't find yourself in the embarrassing position I was of being fully able to change the wheel. <laughs> but ill-equipped. Mm. Yeah, what a schoolboy error. Anyway, let's not speak of it again. I think that'll do for now. Uh, stay safe everybody, and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.